Good to see you here. Well, we got at least maybe half the church here today. Praise the Lord. So that's pretty good for Memorial Day. And uh, Memorial Day is supposed to be all about remembering the military people that give their life for our country. And uh, I don't know how many we got that served in the, in the military. I mean, if you served in the military, I served in it. I know Robin did, and I don't know if you did. Uh, Stan, that's the one Stan that did serve in the military. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Amy. See, I forget somebody. Sure as the world. Let's give them a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you for your service. Praise God. And, of course, we got some that's deceased that served, Brother Corey. Uh, and that's what really it's supposed to be about. And uh, we're just thankful for the goodness of the Lord. And... Uh, I won't do like uh, I won't do like the preacher this morning that uh, went to church and uh, all he had to come to church was one old farmer and uh, he got up and told him he said well look I'm not gonna I'm gonna preach just like the house was full and so he preached and he preached and he preached man he preached and at the end of the service he finally come up and the old farmer told him he said well preacher he said you know. I understand, he said, sometimes I just have one cow come up for food, he said, but I don't usually give them the whole wagon load, <laughs> praise God. So I'll try not to give you the whole wagon load just because uh, we got several out today because Memorial Day, they're off somewhere with family and friends and uh, out of state, a lot of them doing different things, And uh, but we understand that and uh, so, uh, but we going, we, you know, I believe the Lord is here, and I believe we still need the Lord. Amen. Amen. And uh, I am going to, I did pray, and uh, I felt the Lord drop something in my spirit, and uh, I really believe it will help you. And I want to, you know, if I'm going to take the time to preach, and you're going to take the time to get up and get dressed and come to church, I feel we need to, I want to try to give something that I feel that's going to be a blessing to us. Amen. And uh, I'll try not to give you the whole wagon load. But uh, if I don't finish, and I may not, uh, I'll just finish it another time. But I've learned to do that. We can just uh, do like uh, Mike does sometimes. It's going to be a series. Amen. And uh, But anyway, uh, I want to, if you got your Bibles, if, uh, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 10, uh, verse 38. And... Uh, it says, Now it came to pass that they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet, and heard his word. <coughs> but Martha was cumbered about much serving. In other words, she was her house. She felt responsible for him being there as a guest and the people that were there. So she was very busy serving everyone, and uh, and said, but she and she came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Lord, this is taxing me to death, you know, because Martha sitting at the feet listening, and here I am. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Mary is sitting at. I've got, got to get them backwards here. Mary's sitting at the feet listening. Martha's worried about. Everybody not getting served. And, of course, he just said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, this is Jesus showing that there must be a priority on spiritual things over the earthly responsibilities, even though both are very important. We know how many know those earthly responsibilities are important, and that somebody needs to serve, somebody needs to help. But the lesson here is that we never put earthly responsibilities over spiritual for spiritual things. So this was the one time Jesus was going to be there, and Mary wanted to get all the information she could. Amen. And uh, if we'd have heard that Jesus was going to be at the house today in physical form we probably would have a house full, amen. And, uh, you know, but Jesus is here. He's in spiritual form, but he is here because he's everywhere that we're gathered in his name. And he's, and then in the book of Matthew 23, 23 through 24, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He's rebuking the Pharisees here. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin 
and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not left the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a net and swallow a camel. So he said, you're gagging in a net while you're swallowing a camel. Now Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for being totally unbalanced in their service to God. Of course, their main goal was to look good on the outside, to please men. They wanted to look good before men. This is what Jesus told them. You clean up the outside. He went on to say in the next group, you clean the outside, but you don't clean the inside. You know, you're like whited sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but the inside you're full of dead men's bones. See, they want to look good on the outside to please men rather than looking good on the inside in their own heart and pleasing God. Now, we can criticize them, but if we're not careful, we can become unbalanced in our own lives by focusing on just certain areas of our walk and not our overall walk with God. And I, I want to preach this morning. This is what I feel the Lord dropped in my spirit on balancing faith, character, spirituality, and earthly responsibility. Balancing faith. We should have a thing that I uh, had Paul make. I don't know if he's back there. He made up a deal for me to put up there. There we are. So we just kind of get in your mind a little bit. Faith, character, spirituality, and earthly responsibility. We got to balance these things in our life because if you get too much over into one area, you're going to be really hurting yourself in another. And it's quite a, quite a job to do this, so I want to talk about this because I've seen people that uh, got messed up in life because they did not balance what they were doing in life. They got unbalanced in what, what was going on. And, uh, of course, the Bible is full of parables and uh, live examples of people's lives people's lives that have failed to keep balance and proper priorities. It's about proper, proper priorities and choices as well in their lives. The parable of the wedding uh, supper, for instance, is another parable that shows imbalance, shows misplaced priorities, and shows bad choices. And the invitation was given. Go out, you know, invite them to the marriage supper, which is the type actually of being invited to come into the church. Come to the wedding supper. That's a type of coming to Christ, being invited to come and be a part of the church, be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, be a part of Jesus Christ and, and what he's got going. And they begin to make excuse. One said, hey, man, I bought land. Well, what is that? That's materialism. Another said, well, man, I bought oxen. What is that dealing with? That deals with occupation, jobs, or work. I mean, those we can, what's the warning here? We can get so busy with jobs and work, we will not have time for the things of God if we're not careful. And this is something in America today, which is a cap, uh, capitalism-type nation, we uh, really have to watch. And uh, another one said, well, I took a wife. Well, what is that? A, a, see, parables are given to kind of symbolize. That's the symbolism of family. I'm too busy with family. I don't have time for the things of God. And it's not that family is not important. It's not that uh, possessions are not uh, uh, important and need to be took care of. It's not that we uh, should not work. We do have to work. But the problem was they totally didn't uh, balance what they were doing and prioritize the right things. And they put the priorities on the physical things instead of the things of God. And they totally missed out because he said, none of these that was bidden shall come to my supper. In other words, they got the invitation, but they refused to come in. So none of them that were bidden, he said, so you go out into the highways and byways and just invite the lame, the blind, the halt, anybody to come, you invite them into my supper. He said, because it's going to be full. And... Uh, and so we realize that uh, it's a matter of choices and priorities and, and keeping yourself balanced in life. Now, there's a lot we could talk about when we own this subject, but time wouldn't permit it. So look, we're going to talk briefly about the four subjects that I mentioned up here on that chart and how we need to be, get these four balanced in our lives. And uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is faith. And... Uh, I think I can close that unless I need to 
get it back because I pretty well printed all this out, is faith. And the, when you talk about faith, there's a chapter on faith in the Bible, the book of Hebrews, that talks about it. Hebrews chapter 11, and we want to we want to read Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 11, verses 1 through 3. He said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's what you hope for, but it's not yet seen, but you, you see it in the spirit realm. You're praying for it. You believe it, all right? For by it the elders obtained a good report. And I wanted to read this next one because it's very important. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, I want you to realize that we talk about that. I preached the message on the power of the spoken word. This is speaking things in faith and believing God. Our God is supernatural. He's a creator. And he simply created it through his word. And in that example, when he cursed the fig tree and went down and cleansed the temple and came back, remember I've said this is about a transition of power to the apostles, now to the church. And he said, you, you could get the power to speak to that mountain. If you got faith in God and you believe it, you can speak to that mountain, say, Be thou removed and be cast in the sea, and it shall be done. So he's saying here there's a transition of power. But I want you to realize that your words spoken in faith in God carry power. Matter of fact, they said they broke down an atom one time. And it was getting down to the smallest particle, and when they got to the very center, they finally got the ability to split that. At the very center, there was something they could never figure out what it was. And when they finally figured out what it was, it was a, just a sound. It was like a word. It was a sound, in other words. In other words, God created the atoms for that our words can create, and His words create. And God can actually, he will move on your words and, and when you speak them in faith. So faith is very, very important. And I want you to see that because it's very important you understand that. You speak something in faith. And uh, he said, whatsoever he saith shall come to pass. When you speak it and believe it and it's the will of God and you speak it and you say it, that's why they, there's a group of the Word of Faith people who don't believe in ever talking negative, and that's a good idea, you know, because you speak things negatively, you, you might cause something to come to pass negatively. So they don't, they don't like to ever talk about negative things. They want to talk about positive things and training our spirit to speak positive and to be positive and not say negative things. Because verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, then I'd say faith is pretty important, don't you? If you can't please God without it, then faith has got to be important to God. It may not be important to you, but it's important to God. Because he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, this is a very important part of our walk with God and the Bible says we can't please God without it. All right? Now, I've seen people that had a lot of faith in God to perform certain acts, miracles, miraculous acts, such as healing. And this was the strong point of their life more than character. You know what I'm saying? This, you, they had a lot of faith, but they didn't focus a lot on character. Does this make any sense to you? But they could really believe God. Well, we need to believe God for miracles, you know. And uh, they didn't have a lot of, uh, sometimes, spirituality or earthly responsibility. But they had faith. That was their strong point. They, they really believed in faith. And uh, some emphasized it so strong that they began to criticize and judge other people, you know, uh, for having, not having the same faith they had, in, in the, which shows their weakness of character. You see what I'm saying? Then their weakness of character gets revealed because they start criticizing and judging other people for not having the same kind of faith they have and, and where they wouldn't put the emphasis on faith and the emphasis on what we need to see is miracles. We need more miracles. You know, that was their whole thing in life. We want to see this. And, uh, you know, they're pleasing God in one area while failing very badly in another. 
And this is what I, I'm trying to talk about today. We don't need to just please God in one area. We need to please Him in all four of these areas. Because all four of these areas are very important to God. Now, faith is important. You can't please God without it, the Bible says. But now, this is why we need to, the, the, you see, it pleases God when we believe Him and activate our faith in Him in our lives. And when He sees that, it pleases God. He wants us to believe Him for things. Sometimes we have faith in certain areas in our lives more than we do others, and sometimes our faith is affected by our past experiences or, or something we have witnessed in our life. We're affected by that. It affects her. My faith was affected by that. Your faith probably has been affected by it too. For instance, uh, when I was a child and didn't really know God, I just attended a denominal church that was kind of not spirit-filled. Just, you just went there, and I was just glad when we got over and I got to go home. You know, I'd say I probably learned absolutely zero in all the years I went. It was all my childhood. But... I saw a picture of a man up there with some sheep on the on the wall. He had a staff and had some sheep around him. I thought that must be God. And uh, I didn't know who God was. I didn't know what God was. I didn't know anything. I, you know, we talked about God. We heard about Noah. We heard about the three Hebrew children. But I really didn't learn in the deep things of God at all. But uh, when I was a child, I was uh, we was had a storm came through our place and. We had uh, three houses, like my house, uh, my, gran my, gran my grandpa's house, and then my aunt's house. We were right down the road. They were just probably a few hundred yards apart, maybe a quarter of a mile from my house to my grandpa's, and maybe 200 yards to the next house. Well, I thought the storm was over, so I walked down to talk to my cousins and play with them. And uh, when I got down there, a tornado hit. And uh, it wasn't a big tornado, but it was a powerful tornado. It wasn't just what I'm saying. It wasn't huge as far. Some tornadoes are a half mile wide. Some are a quarter of a mile wide. I've lived in Ark, but in three of them, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and just to, just God is all that saved me in every one of them because I could have been killed in any one of them. This was the first one I could have been totally killed in because wherever it was at, which was probably, I'm going to say it was 50 yards wide, it wasn't a huge tornado, but it was devastating everything in its path. I mean, it was totally cutting the grass off that high, just like a lawnmower. It was just, just looked like you took a lawnmower. It was getting everything. Pine trees this big around behind our house, 100 feet tall. It just twisted them in two like matchsticks and snapped them. Just, choo, 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 just twisted them in two. Some of them it blew over. Some of it just twisted. When you can take a pine tree this big around and twist it in two and snap it, that's a lot of power and a lot of force. You see, tornadoes, uh, get, they come without warning. They're not like hurricanes. You can run. Uh, you can run a tornado too, but you better be quick But because uh, they're usually right on top of you when you hear them. You hear them sound like a freight train coming. And uh, So uh, anyway, uh, Tornado came behind our house, didn't hit the house, went out in the field, where my, actually went right across where my camp is now, and my sh barns and everything I have in Arkansas. Was nothing there then but a field. Went out in the field between my grandpa's and our house, went due north, went out to the up back side of the field and turned around, just made a U-turn and came dead toward us. I mean, it was coming straight at us. We watched it for like a quarter of a mile or better it just coming dead at us and it was picking up everything in its path and uh it got when he hit the tomato crop it, we had raised tomatoes there and it had sticks and strings and tomatoes just sucked them up just just it was just sucking them up and uh our house was probably off the highway i'm gonna say from here to that wall it was right on the highway they had widened the highway and and our house was right on the road. And by the time, and the tornado now was just across the road. It was probably as close from here to Wharton Street from us. It was, couldn't have been over 25 to 50 yards from us. When uh, my aunt kept screaming, where's the Bible, where's the Bible, where's the Bible? And I was running around scared to death. Is it going to pick us up? Is it going to pick us up? Because, uh, man, I, w I was scared. Because it looked like, you know, that thing was wiping out everything. 
And uh, it was coming dead at us. And she, she finally found the Bible because she really just didn't know where it was. She, hadn't, she didn't hardly ever read it. And they didn't really go to church that much. But she found she had faith that she took that Bible and pointed it toward that tornado. She grit and finally found it. And it, it, by now it was, it was just across the road. It's 25 yards from us or probably the length of this church from us. And she turned it like that, and that thing just said, shh, disappeared. Well, this is one kid that never forgot that. <laughs> you talk about made an impression on your mind, son, that made an impression on my mind. Because I went from death to life in one moment. Because she had faith, and I believe it was more an act of faith than it was anything. The other day, Brother, Brother uh, Dwight told Sister Jack that he had that tornado in Oklahoma. I had one guy, he said he tried that. He put that Bible out. <laughs> but I tried that's what Brother Smith said. I put that Bible out. Yeah. Well, it works if you believe it. See, it's whatever. If you got faith in it, God can honor that faith, and he will most times. And uh, so it, it creates an act of faith. Well, man, I didn't tell nobody. But every time there'd come a cloud after that, I'd slip in there and get a Bible. I'd point it toward that cloud. <laughs> Daddy said, I can't figure this out. That storm come up, and hail got everybody's crops but ours. It got everybody's crops over here, got everybody's crops down here. I don't understand it. It, it didn't get our crop, didn't touch it. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. And that went on, you know, all my life I had that. And then I was in a couple of tornadoes that I could have been killed in one at the school. And uh, actually I was right under a chimney that had blew through the roof and it actually hung in the Celotex. About a 20-ton chimney was right over my head. But see, God had... Uh, You in this foreknowledge that someday I was going to be a preacher. And he had to stop that thing from coming. It went through the roof, but stopped in the two befores and celotex. Now, how can it do that? It can't. It hit, blew the walls out of the building, blew the shop that caught the shop directly. There wasn't nothing left of it. Just scattered bricks and just lucky no one was in it. Took my aunt's trailer house up there in the middle of town and folded it like a bell pole and laid it up on top of the trees, all four walls laid out flat, just like just as she stepped out of it. And uh, I've seen all kinds of things. Uh, but I got to praying over the weather, and I've been doing it for years. Did y'all ever wonder why that when uh, we had Hurricane Harvey, wasn't it the last one, that bad one? Why did El Campo get spared? When Wharton got flooded over the houses, Victoria got blown away. Why did we get spared? We got a little bit of wind and a little bit of rain, and we become the rescue area for the rest of the area. Now, I'm going to tell you what I believe it was. You, I'm not... I mean, you laughed at me. I've been laughed at. It don't bother me to be laughed at. Me and Jay stood in the middle of H-E-B. We didn't care who was standing. And we stood there and we rebuked that thing off of our city and said, Lord, we don't want any major rain. We don't want any major winds. And it never came. You could watch it. I showed, remember I showed Brother Michael. I said, look at here. That storm was splitting. It just go right around us, just like that. It was just, it just constantly splitting, going right around us. All in big old yellow clouds, or just red clouds, would just split and leaving El Campo. I said, you, what, "What's doing that?" He said, "That's amazing." I said, "It's just faith in God. It'll work, man." You see, I've been watch, I've been doing it for years, and uh, and uh, you know, we was on a golf course in Colorado, and uh, a storm come up. Start here come the rain. It don't hardly ever rain up there, but. Here come a rain. Me and Brother Lopez, guy, one of the Lord, was out there. We was on our vacation. And Brother Lopez said, Brother Smith, you better pray. I just said, in Jesus' name, I rebuked that cloud. You go around us. And that thing just turned and went around us. Never rained. We never quit playing. 
You know, that's crazy, Brother Smith. No, I don't believe it is. I believe if you got faith, and I've been laughed at about it. I, I've had uh, about one time uh, uh, Ray Setzer, some of said Shirley was here, says Karen's mom. Ray was supposed to meet me in Arkansas. We was going to work. A hurricane, we was in the middle of a hurricane, it popped up. A hurricane just popped up out of nowhere right off the coast here, just without much warning. He called me and said, you still going to Arkansas? I said, yeah, I'm going to work all week. He said, man, he said, I'm in four foot of water. I can't even get out of my, I said, well, I'm not. I said, it ain't going to rain on me. He said, you're crazy. I said, I'm telling you, it ain't going to rain on me all the way to Arkansas. He said, you're nuts. It's raining everywhere. I said, no, it ain't going to rain on me. And I would see clouds that absolutely looked like they were so dark and black to it was unreal. And I'd just say, Lord, in Jesus' name, it's not going to rain on me. And you know what? When I've, I've told this, when I went over the hill at Dyball, Texas, you go over the hill, it's about a mile into town there on 59. It was pouring down rain on that side of the road. It was not raining on this side of the road at all. And I went all the way to Arkansas, and all I got was a little bit of sprinkle on my windshield a couple of times. That was it. And I went through some of the blackest, darkest clouds you'd ever see in your life. When I got to Arkansas, my brother said, what are you doing up here? You ain't going to get nothing done. I had hurricanes coming up here. I said, no, it's not. I said, I got to work this week. He said, I done made this plan to work all week, and I'm going to work on the farm all week. I'm not, that's, that's not coming here. He said, you're crazy. They done said it's coming right, up to coming right up through Louisiana, coming dead at us. I said, yeah, but I told it to go when it hit the Louisiana line to turn and go off to the, off to the east. It ain't coming here. <coughs> oh, you crazy. You know what you're talking about. My own brother. Can you believe that? <laughs> Guess what it did? It hit the Louisiana line. All of a sudden it turned and went due east, right down the Louisiana line. Never made it into Arkansas. And we're not but about 50 miles or maybe 75 miles from the Louisiana line. We're not that far inside the Louisiana line. But you know what? I've seen God do that kind of stuff. And I, I one reason we ain't had the bad weather right here still lately as some of the others have had, I believe. I've been praying about the weather. So I'm, I just, whatever happened, not me, I pray about it. If I don't need rain, I tell the Lord, I don't need no rain, God. I got up one Saturday morning. Remember this, baby? And uh, she always kids me about, yeah, you sent the storm, to, you let the storm come to Victoria. You know, that hurricane? I said, well, baby, I just called you was there, and then you needed to be rescued by, uh, you were a damsel in distress, and so you needed to be rescued. So I spent my time down in Victoria rescuing her. Amen. It worked. I got her. Amen. But uh, I got up one Saturday morning. I said, I'm going to mow this morning. Because it takes about four hours to mow out there where we're at, to mow all that, with a 60-inch diesel commercial Kubota zero turn. I mean, you got to be flying to mow it in four hours. And uh, so uh, I told her, I'm going to mow this morning. She said, look. We looked out the kitchen window and looked like about Danabang. It was black as soot. I mean, just solid black. It looked like that thing was going to wet the world. I grabbed my radar, and it was all across the sky coming dead at us, just a big old cloud. I said, you know what? This ain't going to work. I said, in Jesus' name, I rebuke that cloud in the name of Jesus. I know it's close. I know it looks impossible, but, God, I got a moat. And I said, I want you to break that thing up or let it rain out or whatever you want to do with it. Take it somewhere else. Just whatever you want to do. But I don't want it raining here. And it never rained. That thing began to get thinner and lighter and just disappeared by the time it got to us. He said, well, ah, Brother Smith, are you saying you control the weather? No, I'm saying God controls the weather. And if you got enough faith, and, and you can speak it, and God will honor it. That's all I'm saying. Now, see, this is something worked with me, and it happened because this is. Now, I've had other things in my life. 
uh, because there's there's a uh, I've had a lot of success in certain other areas. I, one time I went through a season uh, when I was had a lot of success in laying hands on people and then receiving the Holy Ghost. I'd be asleep at night. I had folks got their minds set on evangelism and they'd be out witnessing the people and. Uh, they would call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Brother Smith, we got a guy out here. We're trying to pray him through the Holy Ghost. Come down here and lay hands on him. I'd get out of bed, get my clothes on, go down there, and I would tell him, yeah, man, i tell him, did you repented? Yes. I said, well, then you begin to praise God. I'm going to lay hands on you, and when I do, you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd lay hands on him, and he'd begin to speak in unknown tongues. It just went on for a long time. It was, a, you know, it just seemed like in that area, it shifted to that area right there. And uh, then I then went through a period of time, and especially when I lived in Colorado, that uh, God began to honor me and bless me in praying for couples that could not have children. And I remember I was praying at a meeting, I was talking about that at a meeting and talked about couples I'd prayed for, and this couple come up and said, we can't have children. So we've been trying to have children for a long time. Would you pray for us? This is when I got through preaching. I said, yeah, I'll pray for you. And I prayed for him. And it, it takes a lot of bone to do this. And I said, you know, the Lord told me to tell you in nine months you're going to have a baby. And uh, by the way, it's going to be a boy. And nine months later, they had a baby boy. See, what is it? The power of the spoken word. That operates out of faith. You see what I'm saying? And, of course, we've seen a lot of healing miracles, a lot of things right here. We've seen cancers healed. We've seen lungs, people given lungs. We've seen a lot of powerful things happen. But it just seems like but faith is an area that we want to try to really maintain, but we can't leave the other areas undone. See, you can focus on just what God. But here's the thing about it. Uh, I don't think that is the most important area of your life. I think the next one we're going to talk about, character, is um, this is one of the most important of them all and should be a result of your spirituality and spiritual maturity, which was the overall purpose of Jesus coming in the first place. He came to redeem and transform us and give us the ministry of reconciliation. Is that right? When you put all the scriptures and the word together. See, it's when you mature in Christ enough that you begin to live after the fruits of the Spirit and not after the works of the flesh. And every word we speak should be spoken out of the fruits of the Spirit and never after the feelings of the flesh. Now, that is the key to Christian character. That's what Christian character is. A lot of people don't even know what Christian character is. That's what Christian character is. It's where you never speak after the works of the flesh, but you speak after the fruits of the Spirit and act. Speak and act. Let me read. Some of you, are, you may not know what they are. Let me read from the Bible. Galatians 5. I'll show you the Apostle Paul agrees with me. 5, 13 through 26. A little lengthy reading. I'll try to read through it kind of hurriedly. It said, For brethren, you have been called... Uh, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For the, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. He said, when you love your neighbor and you love people, you're fulfilling the law, the law. Now, let me say this. He usually says there's two commandments. First, you love God with all your heart, and then you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. But let me tell you something. You can't love your neighbor as yourself without obeying the first commandment first, loving God with all your heart. There's no way you can unconditionally love your neighbor with, all, you know, with everything in you if you haven't loved God, because God has to make that change and give you, empower you to have the ability to do that. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yes. He just didn't say it every time, but most times he did say it and put that commandment first. But it, he said, if you bite and devour one another, take heed you be not consumed one of another. So we can't go around biting and devouring one another. That is to say, that walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh which are manifest, which are these, and he's going to name them, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, which is extreme lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, 
Hatred is an emotion. Hatred is a feeling. Hello? It's a fleshly feeling. Okay? Hatred. Variance. That's division. Strife, in other words. Immolations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, envious of someone, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You know, there's a lot more, but that's just anything like that. Of the which I told you before, I'm told you that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom of God is within us. It's God's spirit within us. So God's spirit within us should produce the fruits of the spirit, not the works of the flesh. See, this whole life that we're in now, is not to me, it's not a battle with the devil. Because if you get power over self, you've got power over the devil. I don't ever glorify the devil. The devil, the devil don't make me do nothing. LT does it. My flesh makes me do more than the devil ever thought about doing. The devil will take advantage of your flesh. He'll cause things to happen if your flesh is out of control that you're going to lose it. Hello? He said, for the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or self-control. I remember one preacher had a new boy just got the Holy Ghost. He said, he was preaching, he said, anybody know what long-suffering is? He said, suffering for a long time. <laughs> but actually it's not, it's self-control. Gentleness, goodness, some translations say kindness. I like that word kindness. You know, we need to be kind to people, even your enemies. Faith, meekness, temperance. This is the things that the fruits of the Spirit right here. He's, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. And where they've killed the flesh, they won't respond to it. They refuse to respond to it. Let me tell you, you can feel the effects of flesh, but we have to train our spiritual man to rule our fleshly man. And you have to train your fleshly man to live in obedience to the spiritual man. You've got to train it. It don't happen overnight. Well, I'm like, you got the Holy Ghost. Well, you've got the power, but now you've got to train that. You've got to come to the point that you never speak after the flesh, and you never react after the flesh. In other words, if you get angry, the Bible said anger, but sin not. So you can get angry, but you don't have to sin. I mean, some, you can't help having a feeling of anger if somebody does enough to you. But God says don't react to that. See what I'm saying? You react to that anger with the fruits of the Spirit. You, you react to it out of love. You react to it out of forgiveness. That's why Jesus said, hey, if your brother compels you to go a mile, go with him too. If they sue you at law and take your coat, give me your cloak also. I had a guy beat me out of $3,700. Just flat beat me out of it. I bought a gun. And uh, it didn't work right. And I sent it back to him, and he never returned my money. Beat me out of $3,700. He never sent it to me. I got a lawyer and everything else, but he said, it ain't worth going up for a fight no more. And finally, I said, you know what? I shouldn't fight this. Jesus said, if he's going to take your coat, give me a cloak. I'll just let him be that way and, and depend on God to repay me some other way. I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to let that thing go. I'm not going to tie my life up in bitterness and frustration, and heartache, and sorrow over $3,700. See, it's your choice. I can let that make me bitter. I can let it make me mean. See, sometimes situations that people never forgive and never get over destroy their whole life. And their whole family. Because you don't want to destroy you. It's about to let a root of bitterness springing up. And many be defiled. See bitterness defiles a lot of people. If you get bitter over something. I tell you bitterness is acid that destroys the vessel it's stored in. I'm determined I'm not going to let nobody else's sin. Make me and destroy me in bitterness. If I'm destroyed it needs to be over my own stupidity. Not somebody else's. 
So it's our choices. We got we got to balance this thing. We got to stay balanced, you know. I can't just run around and thank God that the cloud didn't rain on me. I got to think about it. I got to have character too. You know what I'm saying? I got I got to have everything in order. See, he said they that Christ have crucified the flesh with affections lust. If we live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, don't be desirous of vain glory. I want to repeat that. Don't be desirous of vain glory. Provoking one another, envying one another. I mean, remember a message I preached here about the river of life. I preached two messages after my wife passed away on the river of life that God gave me a revelation on that. And it was, to me, one of the most powerful messages I've ever preached. It changed me more than any message I've ever preached in my life. If you haven't heard them, I'd advise you to get them and listen to them because it will definitely change you if you listen to it. I had Brother Bloom call me the other day, and he said that they had a couple that uh, was fighting and fussing in their marriage. They wanted to get along, but they just couldn't get along. I said, Brother, why don't you tell them to go up? And I told him how to find it on my website. I told him when I preached it, and I said, tell them to go up there and, and download that and listen to it. They can get it free off the website. He called me back and said, man, they both listened to it and said, man, it changed their whole life. He said, we need to put that in the book. And he wrote it out in a book form and sent it to me. On my computer, that's when I had to move out of the office. Just now I got my computer back up. I hadn't even had time to print it out yet. But we're going to write a book on it about the application of the river of life. See what God showed me the river of life was. It came in the book of Isaiah, I from under the house of God. Well, who's the house of God today? Who's the Bible say the house of God is? You're the temple of the living God. The church, us, people. God, he said, he's not going to live in a temple made with hands any longer. He said, he's going to live in you. He's going to be our God. We're going to be his people. Amen. And it issued from that river of life, from the house of God, it is from the church. He said, out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water. And God showed me that the river of life is the words we speak from our mouths. Amen. After the Spirit of God and if we're going to be a river of life, we can't speak after the flesh. We got to, everything we speak has to be after the fruits of the Spirit. I hope that makes some sense. And uh, I did a whole lesson on that and proved it biblically. And uh, <clears throat> see, the whole key is never speak words. When you're, okay, out of anger or jealousy or hatred or pride. See, we've got to always respond in the fruits. And uh, we've got to live in a state of constant forgiveness to do that. And realize that most of the world are large, and a large number of immature Christians are controlled and respond to life after the feelings of their flesh. Did y'all hear me? You've got to realize you're living in a world where nearly all the world, business people, Everybody else respond in the flesh because they don't have the Spirit of God in them, or many of them. And a lot of immature Christians, don't re they don't live after the Spirit. They live after the flesh. Does this make any sense? So if you're going to do that yourself, you've got to live in a state of perpetual forgiveness. If you don't, you can't obey this. And uh, now the reason my wife and I have never still had an argument. We've been married over a year, about a year and a half now, somewhere in that area. I didn't say we had not had a disagreement. I mean, oh, there's a difference between a disagreement and an argument. We disagree every now and then, but we don't fight and argue about it. And I've been able to keep my promise to her when I married her that I would never criticize her speak hateful to her, speak mean to her. And the reason I do that, I refuse to say anything to her when I'm angry, upset, or hurt out of that feeling. In other words, I refuse to speak out of that feeling. And I'll tell you, when I started living like this, after I got the revelation of the river of life, I realized when I did that, it was a sin. And it took that revelation to make me realize how much God hated it and how much out of the will of God I was 
every time that I got angry and spoke out of my flesh. Boy, it's getting quiet in here now. So I had to repent. And it changed my life. I swear, I promised her, I felt I got enough confidence in this that I'm going to promise her when I'm married. And I told her, before we go up for the big vows, I'm going to give you some other vows that I feel like she's not covered in the marriage vows. It's very important. And I promised her right here, I'd never criticize her. I'd never run her down. I'd never be mean to her. I'd never be hateful to her. That I would love her. And I would always speak to her after the fruits of the Spirit. Say, so you can't do that. You can do that. You just got to make sure that you don't ever speak when you're upset or mad or angry what you're feeling in your spirit. So, I mean, that, that's the way, that's what it's all about. You've got to live after the, see, you can't just, see, okay, yes, I've, I've rebuked some clouds. I've, I've stopped rain. I believe that. I've seen God honor some my prayers. I've seen him heal some people. But that, don't give me the right to dis, to not uh, acknowledge the need for character. Does this make any sense? I've still got to have, that don't give me some kind of a special privilege to override character. It's just making some sense. You've got to keep it balanced. You've got every area of your life, you've got to consider it important. And you've got to walk with integrity. And, uh, and the, really the Apostle Paul agrees with me. And uh, let's see, well, I watched the clock. My God is done gone. I ain't got the two of them. What happened to the clock? What happened to the hour and a half message that I used to preach? Amen. That's about right, about what I need. Right, but he said in Ephesians 4, 22, put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. What's that? The flesh. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which after God has created righteousness and true wholeness. Putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, if, you make, if something makes you angry, don't sin while you're angry. Don't sin because don't say things and do things that's wrong as a reaction out of that anger. Don't do that. Don't sin because something made you angry. And don't let the sun go down on that wrath. Get rid of that anger. Get it out of your spirit so you can react again after the fruits of the spirit. How many marriages have been destroyed because of the lack of this principle right here? I believe if every couple would, lead, would live these principles I'm preaching right now, there'd never be a problem. Some people get the feeling I can force her or him to do what I want by being mean to them. That's the worst thing you can do. It's not the godly way to do it. I think you can love them into it more than you can hurt them into it. Praise God. <clears throat> Neither give place to the devil. Let him that still, still, stole still no more. But let him rather work with his own hands. That's good with uh, about work right there. The thing which is good to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth. What? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now that's the Apostle Paul, not Larry Smith talking. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. What is corrupt communication? Communication that's after the flesh. That's out of a spirit of anger, hatred, envy, jealousy, strife, bitterness. 
Boy, you hear earwigs crawling all over this floor this morning. Now, I told you this would help you. It really will. It'll help you. But for the, he said, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that he may minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, which you're sealed to the day of redemption. You've got the Holy Spirit, and you don't grieve it. Let it work. Let it speak. Let it react. Let it move. Let it take over. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. What's clamor, Brother Smith? That's when you, your mouth opens, you throw it in gear, and 20 minutes later your brain catches up and says, oh, what did I just say? <laughs> and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, which is hatred. He said, let every bit of that junk be put away from you. It's not a God. That's the old man. You don't, you're not there anymore. You're dead to the old man. You don't talk after that anymore. You don't react to that anymore. You don't have a right to respond to that. You're filled with the Holy Spirit now. The Spirit of God has to control you now. Well, but you don't know what they did. You don't know what he did. He gave me the ability to forgive that. And look at the next verse. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Why? Because he's forgiven me, because I'm not perfect. Are you perfect? Far from it. That's why I need all these lessons and help and control and balance in my life, because I'm not perfect. I'm just a human being that's subject to failure. And the only reason I don't fail more than I do is because i got the Holy Spirit in me helping me. And I refuse to respond to my feelings of the flesh sometimes, because I get frustrated you don't get frustrated. If you don't feel feelings of frustration, you're already dead and don't know it. You know, you, you got, we all get this. It's, it's common to man. It's just because we're still in the flesh. See, uh, spirituality, let me just touch it briefly. Uh, and that's your personal relationship with God. It's what I'm talking about, spirituality. This involves your meditations, your thoughts, your prayer life, your fasting, your various types, uh, a fasting of various types, your faith in God, to act on your behalf, your faith in Him, to perhaps hear His voice, to operate in certain gifts of the Spirit as you, if you've been gifted in that area. Now, this is part uh, that gives you the power to perform. Spirituality is what gives you the power to perform what the Bible has commanded you to do. It comes out of relationship. Remember, I've told you that faith is born out of relationship with God. God spoke that to me. Faith is born out of relationship. You get mountain-moving faith through your relationship with God. This is where your character is built, is in your relationship with God. And your character is a sign of your true spirituality. See, some folks think they're spiritual if they talk in tongues or have the gifts of the Spirit. No, you know what that is? They're still in a Pentecostal mindset. We've got to graduate from a Pentecostal mindset to a kingdom mindset. The kingdom of God is within us. A Pentecostal mindset, you just talk in tongues, you see, pray a few miracles, you, you still have the right then to act like a devil. No, you don't. I've seen people talk in tongues in church and go right home, and their husband had to call me because she went home and treated him like a devil and talked to him like a dog. But she made everybody think she was spiritual because she gave a message in tongues in church. No, what is that? Unbalanced. Unbalanced. The Corinthian church had that problem, remember? They had come behind in no gift, but he said, you're carnal. You're unbalanced. Because you're still talking about it. You're still jealous of people. you still got all these feelings in your heart you shouldn't have. You're still bragging of that. You're lifting yourself up. you got all these carnal mindsets. Because you can have the fruits of the gifts of the Spirit. And that's why he said, if you talk in tongues of angels, tongues of men, you don't have love, you're nothing. You give all your body to be burned, but you don't have love, you're nothing. We've got to, we've got to, he said, because love never fails. Praise God. And I believe that with all my heart. And uh, I was going to read some of that, but I don't have time. And let me just touch, keep, uh, I have a, I have a thing, 
that's why I think we need to stay about these four areas. But uh, I have a thing that I sell to tell Brother Lopez, to different ones that, that I do things with. Always do what's right, and God will always bless it, no matter what the situation. Always do what's right. Always do what's right, and God will bless it. Okay? Family, what is earthly responsibilities? I was going to read several scriptures, but I don't have time to read them all. It, it said, uh, he said, we shouldn't work, we shouldn't eat. That's one thing. If you don't provide for your own, pay for your own house, you deny the faith, you're worse than infidel. Charge them that are rich, and uh, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. That's the problem. Don't trust. He that trusted in riches shall fall. The righteous shall flourish as a branch. But he went on in the kingdom mindset of the Matthew 5, and he said, no man can serve two masters. You're either going to love one, hate the other, serve one, deny the other. And he said, take no thought what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Take no thought for your life. He said, God knows you need these things. He said, see the grass of the field? They're not toiling. They're not sowing. See those birds? They're not having a nervous breakdown. He said, take no thought. What's he saying? Don't get your mind all wrapped up in worry and doubt and unbelief about how I'm going to make it in life because God knows you need this stuff. If you'll seek first the kingdom, he'll take care of you and add this stuff to you. He didn't say he'd give you all you wants, but he'd give you all your needs. You may pray for a Mercedes. He may think you need a Volkswagen. <laughs> or a three-wheel bicycle <laughs> with a motor on it. Who knows? So the Bible's pretty clear on the subject, and, and it's very clear that we have a responsibility to feed our families, to take care of things, but there's a clear warning, don't put materialism ahead of things, don't put it ahead of God, and to not get your mind all wrapped up in it, and don't put it ahead of the things of God that you don't have time for church or anything else in the things of God. See what I'm saying? That's the warning. Don't trust in the riches, and don't let it come ahead of God. And don't let it steal all your time that you don't have time for God. Because family can do that. Job can do that. Materialism can do that. A lot of things. So we're aware of these four areas of our life. And I'm going to quit because it's time to quit. Unhook the music. Praise God. But we got to balance these four areas. I hope I've helped you today. We got to balance these four areas of our life. We can't just, it, it, work is important. You need to work. You need to take care of your family. The Bible's commanded that. But don't let, don't trust in those riches and don't, you know, put that ahead of the things of God. Don't forget about God while you're out there working. Some people have actually left church over their jobs and, and moved into situations. Uh, my grandson, Corey, was offered a job uh, that he was going to make a, uh, I think it was $225,000 a year he was offered that job. If he would, but he was going to have to move up into another place in Texas and be gone a lot. He said, forget it. I don't want it because i got to be away from my family. I thought that was a wise decision. See, you got to weigh out. I'm going to tell you, money's not everything. I'm, not, I'm, I'm glad you're blessed. I wish I was blessed more. Because we don't have a lot financially. We barely make it in life. But you know what? I'm not depending on finances to make me happy. I'm depending on God and the relationship she and I have together. Because me and her laugh and talk and cut up and have fun all the time. Sometimes I feel like I'm 16 years old again. <laughs> We have fun. I think that's what a marriage should be. We have fun. We pick at each other all the time. And uh, not in a way to anger one another. We pick at one another in love and then and, and laugh and have a great time. We just have a great time together. I make sure I tell her I love her every day, several times a day, because I do. And, you know, <laughs> some people think that's prideful. No, I mean, it's either prideful or some they've got pride and can't do that. Hey, man, uh, I found out in life, I've been around this thing a long time. I've been here 35 years. I've been in this church 35 years. I've watched a lot of people come, and I've watched them go. I've watched a lot of people try a lot of stuff. I'm going to tell you, what I preach this morning works. 
And if you'll live after the Spirit, love that spouse with all your heart, like you like you'd love God with all your heart, it'll work out. It'll work out. Don't put balance these four areas, faith, character, spirituality, and earth responsibility. When you balance them the way they should be, it's going to, you're going to feel balanced and strong in life. Your faith will be awesome, and you can live happy. As the old story says, and they live happily ever after. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God.